247 years ago. I'm a little bit of history lesson. So, and if I happen to get something wrong, I'm going to ask ahead of time for you history buffs in there. Get me after the service. Don't raise your hand during the message. <laughs> About 247 years ago, just give or take a few days, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the Continental Congress adapted the Declaration of Independence which proclaimed the independence of the new United States of America from Great Britain. See, Great Britain wanted to control this, these 13 colonies, these new, it hadn't been the United States of America yet, and they were about 3,000 nautical miles away, which across the land was 3,500 miles away. It took six to eight weeks to travel here by ship, but yet they wanted to dictate to us what we could and could not do. You know, the people come over here, they're braving all the elements, they're doing all the work, but yet King George still said, hey, I control you all. And what started the real unraveling this thing was the Stamp Act. Now, the Stamp Act was put on the colonists without them even knowing, and it said, okay, you got every legal document that you have. Good, Diane. See, Diane, she's a retired teacher, she's nodding her head, so I'm getting this right. <laughs> Every legal document had to have that stamp on it. Any kind of a paper document had to have that stamp on it. If it was an official document, it had to have that stamp on it. Even a deck of playing cards had to have a stamp on it. Well, the colonists wouldn't stand for it. And they wanted to have a repealing of that act. And that's why that famous saying, we, and those of my generation, we, heard, we got that in school, and maybe future generations got it as well, but it's something that was said to Colin, said, no taxation without what? That's it, good. You're still teaching that. No taxation without representation. And hopefully we have good representation in our government today. Maybe not quite as good as we hope sometimes, but we do have representation. Later on, they, they came with the tea tax. And what the tea tax was on all the import and export of tea into this country, into the 13 colonies. Now, they had the Br British East India Company, a British-owned company. It was kind of almost going under. So they put a tax on the colonists on the tea. And that, and that was to help this company. And the tax was so high and on the, on the British... East India Company was so low that even when they smuggled the tea into this country, the British East India Company had a lower price. I know Mark knows all about what I'm going to talk next about. They had a famous event in the Boston Harbor. Remember what it was called? Boston. The Boston Tea Party. They didn't have little, little sandwiches with cut off bread and all that, no. Some of the colonists dressed up like Indians and they threw all the tea into the harbor. That's it. They made, they made tea, salt, salty tea. But what Britain did was they closed, they closed all the harbor. They closed the harbor there in Boston. And that had an effect on all the different colonies. And not only closed the harbor, they went ahead and said that any British official was not subject to any type of prosecution no matter what they did. So finally, the colonists had all they could take. So on July 2nd, 1776, the Continental Congress voted to approve a motion by a Virginian to separate from Britain. I do have notes here, so I'm keeping pretty close to what is going on. <laughs> they added some words to this, to the Constitution. They added some words to this Declaration of Independence. We've all heard these before, and I'd like to read them again. They are beautiful. They are beautiful. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Amen. I would like to say that we really do good with that, but even with those words, and they are beautiful words, we still struggle with them today. But they're as true today as they were then. We just gotta pay close attention. On July 4th, the Declaration was formally adopted and signed. The American War for Independence lasted around five years, and there was a decisive battle right here in Yorktown in 1781, where we won our freedom. In 1783, they signed a treaty in Paris. 
that is called the Treaty of Paris with the United States, Great Britain, Spain, and France, and the Netherlands. And by the way, it was the French that helped us win that decisive battle. So we weren't in this totally by ourselves. Brave men and women sacrifice much for the freedom and independence that we have. We have brave men and women today also willing to sacrifice and maintain the freedoms that we have. And it's not just in the military. But brothers and sisters, as some of the songs have said and why we're here today, our freedom was not won right at that time. Our freedom was secured around 2,000 years ago on a little hill outside of Jerusalem at Golgotha. And we're going to follow that right on through. Turn with me back to John, John chapter 19, verses 25 through 30. John 19, 25 through 30. But before we go into God's holy word, let me have a prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all the wonderful blessings. And we do thank you for this amazing country and all that the men and women did to secure the freedoms that we have. But we thank you, Jesus. And we pray as we go through your holy word that you'll open our minds and hearts to hear your voice. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, John chapter 19, 25 through 30. Fred did a beautiful job, but I'd like to read them again. I don't need to give any background of what's going on because we're all aware of what's going on right now. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that was John, by the way, standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And she's not talking about him, she's talking about John. Then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. One of the last things Jesus did was to make sure that his mother was going to be taken care of. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, and that scripture, if you look up Psalm 22, 15, you'll see where it talks about that. It says, now this, after knowing all things were accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Now when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. What was finished? Was it just that now Jesus' life was over? No, that was it. He said, it is finished. Because what he came to do was accomplished. In Luke chapter 2, verse 49, we, that wonderful story about how Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple there when he was 12 years old. You know, when they were going to celebrate Passover. And when Mary and Joseph left, Mary thought, Joseph, Mary thought Jesus was with Joseph, and Joseph thought Jesus was with Mary, and they left without him. Remember, we all remember that story, right? And then they found out about three days later that, wait, where is Jesus? And you know how frantic they were to go back to find out, find him. They, they were really, as a parent, you can imagine. So they find Jesus there, listening and teaching. And when they confronted him, as a parent would confront him, he said, but in a very respectful way now, remember this, in a very respectful way, he says, why do you seek me? Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? See, Jesus knew there was a plan for his life. We know it as what? The plan of salvation. Y'all did your lesson in Ephesians this week. We had the plan of salvation put into place since when? Before the foundations of the world. So when Jesus said it was finished, what was finished? It was finished, that plan that God had for him to come here. And he had accomplished what he needed to accomplish. The divine plan for salvation, and it wasn't salvation for him, brothers and sisters, it was that plan of salvation for all of mankind. I should hear more amens on that. Amen, amen to that. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for the plan of salvation. Because it's not just a plan that we're going to get to celebrate when we see him coming into clouds. It is taking effect right now. In that plan of salvation, we have a country that we can worship in and be safe and secure. A plan of salvation that has been all the way through, not just until Jesus returns in the clouds. Go with me to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Just a little bit further. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. This is the Jesus that we worship. It says here in God's word, it said, Let this be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who was being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, because he was equal with God. He was God but made himself of no reputation. See, brothers and sisters, he didn't come down here with lights and all that and saw on CBS and all those stations. No. He made of no reputation. He came in here humble. He came here humble, of no reputation. Take the form of a bond servant. And you know what a bond servant is? That is someone who serves with no wages, expecting nothing in return. He came here as a bond servant. Serving who? Who was he serving? He was serving God and who else? Serving us. Serving us. Taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. Jesus came here. He was going to do whatever it took to accomplish this plan of salvation for each and every one of us. Even to the point of dying on the cross. And I'm not going to go into, into depth of what that death was like, because we've heard that over different sermons in different times. We know, we know what that was like to die on the cross. He knew it, and he was willing to do it. Why was he willing to do it? It's all through the Bible. We hear it so clearly in John 3, 16. Why did he do it? Because he so loved the world that he was willing to come here and die for us and give people an opportunity for eternal salvation. That's the reason. There's no other reason. Because he so loved us and he loved the world. 1 Timothy 1, 15 said, He came to save this world to save sinners. I don't need to ask for a show of hands of who's a sinner in here. Because God has already told us we've all sinned and fallen short. And brothers and sisters, every one of us in here need a Savior. And we need a Savior really, really bad. And we don't need the Savior just when he comes in the clouds. We need that Savior right now. We've got enough challenge in this world. We need that Savior right now. Go to 1 John 3.8. Flip on over with me to 1 John 3.8. John 3.8. He kind of points out who the, devil, who the enemy is. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. From the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to this earth to share the truth about God and the truth about sin, and he did it. Jesus came to show us what it really meant to be created in the image of God, and he did it. In John 10, 10, Jesus came to give us a better life right now, and he did it. In Luke 19, 10, he said, the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost, all of mankind, and he did it. Amen. Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life and ransom for many, and he did it. Amen. And John 15, 13 said, there is no greater love than to give up one's life for his friends, and he did it. And he did it. Jesus came to be our example, our real truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And we can get through the Father 
get to the Father through him. He did it. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 15 through 25. Just back a little bit. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 15 through 25. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as a bondservant of God. See, God is asking us to serve him without looking for any type of pay, you know, to serve him. Because how are we going to get paid in blessings? And also serving God, brothers and sisters, is a privilege. We don't need pay. We don't need pay. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to do good and gentle, but also to the harsh. In other words, we are to do good to people no matter how we're treated, and that's really, really difficult. And we've got to have the example of Jesus Christ to pull that off, don't we? And before we had Jesus in our life, how did we treat others? If they punched us, what did we do? We got even, didn't we? That's right. But be good and gentle, but also be that way to the harsh. For this is commendable, if because of conscience towards God, one endures grief and suffering. For, the credit it, for what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? And we thought, well, wow, that's a really good thing. If I'm beaten for my faults and I take it patiently, how much better can that be? Look what the word says. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. See, that's what Jesus did. Jesus was beaten, and he took it patiently, but he still did good to those who were beating him. Amazing. See, it's amazing. And the freedom that gives us, when we can have the attitude of Jesus, the freedom that it gives us in our life, because you know what? Bitterness and resentment can really pull us apart, can it? It can pull us down. If we can follow the example of Jesus, we can have such freedom in our lives. And it's not easily attained, and we won't be able to do it on our own. For this is that you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who committed no sin, no sin nor was deceit found in his mouth. He, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, have, that we having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Brothers and sisters, it is through Jesus and Jesus alone that we have really been given freedom, and freedom from the bondage of sin. God has blessed us all. And as the song said, God has blessed America. But God has blessed many places as well, in many places as well. But brothers and sisters, we do have an important part in this country in the plan of salvation. It wasn't just Jesus, we have a part in his plan of salvation as well. We are the strongest country on this planet. We're the strongest Christian nation on this planet. We have over 127,000 Christian missionaries, 247 million Christians in this country. Our, our independence and our opportunities have been given to us by Jesus. When Jesus said it was finished, Jesus had completed the work that his father had, had given him to do. Satan failed, Jesus won, and all mankind has an opportunity for eternal salvation. We all have a mission and a part in this. Today, because of the ongoing efforts of many brave men and women, we can still celebrate the 4th of July in safety and security. But our independence did not start with the efforts of people, 
but with the love of God. That's how our independence started, with the love of God. I would like to read a small portion of a letter written by John Adams, one of the primary signers of the Declaration of Independence, the second president, to his wife Abigail on July 2nd, 1776. The second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epoch in history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward and forevermore. You know, a sermon is supposed to put out a challenge. We've all heard it. You know, that's, well, I'm supposed to challenge you in some ways. Well, brothers and sisters, I didn't read every part of that. I left a very important part out. And that's going to be the challenge to each and every one of us. And I'm going to read this again in its entirety. Listen very close. Written by John Adams. On July 1st, 7, July, second day of July, 1776. The second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as a great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as a day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. That's the very first thing he said right there needs to be done before any parties, any hot dogs, any hamburgers, any other type of celebration. It's devotion to God Almighty because God Almighty is the one that provided us independence and they recognized it back then. It wouldn't happen because of them. Amen. Amen. So when we're out there and we're grilling and cooking and we're celebrating, let's remember where this freedom came from. They recognized it. They recognized it. I have one last text to read, an amazing text. Go with me to Psalm chapter 33, verses 16 through 22. Psalm 33, verses 16 through 22. Nobody can say it better than God. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eyes of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy, to deliver their souls from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. Brothers and sisters, to God be the glory. Great things he has done. You have heard this saying, you get what you pay for. No. No. We get what he paid for. And Jesus paid it all. And he paid it all for us. Amen.